And today we're, again, like I said, our final week in the series, We Need to Talk. And today's topic really comes at the end because uh, I was keen to travel through the last four weeks before we got here. We needed to look at how do we engage in the political sphere? How do we think about <clears throat> manhood? How do we engage with experts? How do we look at and engage with a culture that values and prizes and incentivizes victimhood? We need to talk about all those things because they're important in their own right, because they are uh, current cultural issues or problems or values, uh, certainly that they are presenting a worldview or a gospel of good news that's contrary or counter to the good news of Jesus. And so, like we've been saying every week, there is no default natural worldview. There's no um, neutral, scientific, rational default worldview out there. And then everybody kind of comes to that default worldview. And so we'll kind of bring our offering or our ideas into, the, into this default worldview. No, no, there are only competing worldviews, only competing gods, only competing gospels. And although there is a dominant culture among any group of people, uh, the reason that people might think that there's a neutral worldview is because they're just immersed in that worldview. So we, well, I, for example, grew up in Australia. I didn't grow up in just in South Australia. I lived in basically every state, uh, one territory uh, growing up as a kid. And <clears throat> largely Australia was essentially the same geographically. Uh, but through time, Australia has changed significantly. And so the dominant culture, the culture that I grew up in, uh, is different to the dominant culture now. And the dominant culture that kids today are growing up in, they think this is just, this is the default neutral worldview. But in actual fact, it's just the dominant worldview. And the reason that the dominant culture, the dominant worldview says to Christians and other people who have a contrary gospel, contrary good news, contrary worldview, they say, don't indoctrinate your kids. Let them grow up and in, in the neutral default worldview and then let them decide for themselves. What they don't know or what they do know but aren't saying is there is no neutral worldview. Again, this is what we keep looking at every week. There's no neutral worldview, only competing worldviews. And so a dominant worldview that says don't teach your kids, let them grow up and choose for themselves is really saying we can't allow a contrary worldview. We don't want a contrary worldview. We want them to have our worldview. We, we don't want to just be the loudest voice. We want to be the only voice. And so like people always will say this or even realize this because often we don't know that we believe some of the things we believe because we've grown up in the dominant culture, listening to and assimilating into the dominant culture. That's so what we've seen every week. Part of what we've seen every week is our goal, our mission, is to be a counter cultural community within the dominant community that puts on display and heralds, like proclaims, the love of Jesus. That's our goal. That's our, that's our mission, is to put on display, like live out that John 13, 34, 35, the love that Jesus had for us would be the love that we have for one another. We put it on display for a watching world and to show what you will, not just to speak into the culture, here's a better way, but to present to culture, he is the better way. God has made us a particular way in a particular time. He's birthed us in a particular place <clears throat> to know him and to love him and to bring him glory and again to put on display his love to a watching, withering world and invite them in. So when people say, don't teach your kids the truth about Jesus, uh, that's because it's not just a contrary worldview, it's a challenging worldview. It, and it is contrary. And it challenges assumptions, challenges idols, challenges gods. Today, we're going to be looking at gender. And transgenderism in particular. And uh, right from the very beginning, I, I want to encourage you, and again, in particular if you're visiting with us today, uh, we are not a church or a community that uh, tends to um, wave political 
flags. We are a pretty diverse group of people. It's one of the reasons we looked at politics to begin with. Um, and each week, as we've looked at different kinds of things, my hope and, and certainly stated goal has been not that it would just <clears throat> confirm all of your previously held biases, but that we would conform to the character and person of Jesus we meet in Scripture. And that's the goal again today. Gender, and, and transgender in particular, becoming an increasingly large part of our dominant culture. And this is culture that hates dissenting worldviews. That's why we looked at the last couple of weeks, um, experts and victimhood. We have to do that work before we can do this work. And so while I hope today will be in itself a helpful, like self-enclosed sermon, uh, you'll certainly benefit if you've already heard the last four in this series. A few, a, few, uh, a few thoughts from Scripture before we get started. First Peter 3, <clears throat> this is Peter writing, Who then will harm you if you are devoted to what is good? But even if you should suffer for righteousness, you are blessed. Don't fear them or be intimidated, but in your hearts regard Christ the Lord as holy, ready at any time to give a defence to anyone who asks you for a reason for the hope that's in you. Yet... Do this with gentleness and reverence, or your version might say with respect, keeping a clear conscience. And so some people engaging in the cultural gospel of gender, some people approach it wanting to be kind, and in that kindness end up really synchronizing with the cultural view of gender and transgenderism. And in doing so, cease to see God as holy, cease to see Jesus as Lord. And so that's one error we could make as Christians who want to love people. Another error, uh, based on this, this passage, others wanting to maximise Christ's holiness, maximise Jesus' lordship, speak the truth but without gentleness and respect. And we don't want to fall on either, we don't fall into any, either of those ditches on either side. We want to hold to what is true. We want to, again, be that countercultural community of love, putting Christ's love on display without minimizing his holiness at all. In actual fact, proclaiming his holiness. Because as we proclaim his holiness, even though that exposes our sin, our flaws, our brokenness, our rebellion, it also highlights his mercy his grace and what Jesus accomplished on the cross. So we don't need to be apologetic in these things. Or by that I mean we don't need to grovel. We don't need to be like obsequious or kind of hesitant in a proclamation of these things. But we must do it with gentleness. We must do it with respect, with reverence. Today we want to do both. Speak the truth of the hope, the hope we have in Jesus with love and with respect. That's the goal today. Two other things that are, we want to speak to in kind of setting the scene for today. <clears throat> and that is that really I want to speak to two levels today. The first level is the cultural level at large. So the ideas, the worldview, the proponents and their gods. And the other is at the personal level. So the people and families suffering the effects of especially gender dysphoria, uh, whether like actual gender dysphoria or a social contagion of gender dysphoria, for whatever reason, uh, there are many people in our communities, like even in our community, but certainly in our wider community, who are, have significant wrestles and grief and sometimes even despair when it comes to gender. So those who only deal at the cultural level, there are many voices who only deal at the cultural level, uh, tend to be people more at the conservative end of the spectrum tend to deal only up here at the cultural level, thinking, man, if we can just tell people uh, the truth, if we could just look at things objectively or scientifically, if we could just look at the, the care for people writ large, then people will understand. But they also are the ones who often crush the people most personally affected who need love and support. And then there are other people who only deal with the personal, don't wrestle at that cultural level. They tend to minimise the compounding, contagious social effects that leave a deadly worldview unchallenged, which sucks more victims into its destructive path. And so what we want to do is 
We need to speak to both. We can't just speak to any other. As a pastor, um, because I love people, because I've journeyed with people through this exact thing we're going to talk about today, I've been sitting down for two, three, four hours at a time, talking through these things, listening to people, um, people who've been in my discipleship group, people who've been in our community, um, people I'm related to, to hear from them, to learn about it, but also to try to speak God's truth into them with gentleness and with respect, with, respect, with love. If we don't want to just do that. We also have to confront the soil in which it's growing because it's growing fast. So let me pray and we're going to see what Scripture... We're going to look at culture and then we're going to look at what Scripture has to say about it. Father, we need your help, as always. Give us open hearts and minds to your Holy Spirit. Give us a soft conscience to your scriptures, that we would be conformed to the likeness of Jesus. We submit ourselves to his lordship. We revel in his love today. Lord, help us to have deep care, love and attention for people who are struggling in all kinds of ways, like we've looked at over the last couple of weeks. And today, as we focus in on this one particular issue, give us a greater compassion for people who are struggling, people caught between two competing worldviews. Help us to communicate your truth, but with love, with empathy, and with clarity. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. So let's have a look. If you're visiting with us today and you're thinking, man, I wasn't expecting this uh, today, then, uh, you know, I, I mean, I don't apologise because we need to talk about it. That's why we're doing the series, we need to talk about it. Uh, but again, I hope you find it encouraging, um, challenging, um, and really that we, we'll point back to Jesus today. So first, let's look at the cultural level. Uh, I, wanna, uh, I would love to start at the personal level because people really matter. And there are, there are people who've been caught up in this who are victims of the culture who have been treated horrifically under the guise of love and care and affirmation, whose lives are being uh, grievously harmed under the, under the, again, under the guise of care. But we need to talk about at the cultural level first because that filters down to the personal level. So the cultural level, we're, getting, we're seeing a redefinition of the meaning of words, really at a large level, to maximise the adoption of the changing worldview. So sex used to mean, when it comes to biology at least, uh, your biological makeup, those immutable characteristics that you're born with, that are identified at your birth. People will change the word to say, oh, you're assigned something at birth. That's not it at all. You're not assigned anything at birth. People identify. This is the biological reality of who you are. And today I want to say, like we do when we talk about things like abortion, where people will bring up extreme or fringe cases to try to cover for the 98% of cases. I just want to say, well, let's put those things on a shelf for now. We can come back to those things later. Like what happens with the less than 1% of people who can't be clearly identified at birth? So I say, let's put those on a shelf for now, even though those people desperately matter. And the Bible does speak to those people. We love those people. What we don't want to do is just allow a culture to say, well, let's take that 1% and broadly apply it over the 100% and ravish people's lives. Gender used to be the same. Gender sex used to be the same. The right cultural critique of the feminist movement was to say, well, not every boy likes trucks. Not every boy likes roughhousing. Not every boy likes blue. Not every girl likes dolls and dress-ups and princesses. In fact, some boys like traditionally girly things, and some girls like traditionally boyish things. And so there was a right critique where the, uh, the early feminists kind of looked at a curve of gender comparative to sex and said, well, we can plot people on a, 
on a curve where most boys will be in this kind of centre and most girls will be in the centre there, but there are people on the fringes. So what we want to do is we want to say, okay, well, perhaps there is a... In fact, definitely, there's a situation where, like my sister, for example, my sister who um, did a carpentry apprenticeship and then was a diesel mechanic for a while uh, at a time where I picked up like zero tools in my life. Where if you look at like an absurd level, my wife loves mowing the lawn and I really enjoy doing dishes. And so the right critique was, oh, we need to broaden some of our understanding of what it means to be male or what it means to be female. But instead of viewing things on that curve as they really are, and expanding and redefining our view of gender stereotypes to include boys and girls who are at either end of the curve in their sex, our culture has uncoupled sex and gender. Where they said, oh, actually, <clears throat> forget the curve. No more curve. Instead, they've people with this new gender worldview, they've ingrained and pushed those gender stereotypes all the way to the edges. We said, no more curve. Uh, femininity is over here. Masculinity is over here. If you don't look like that, you might be this. Because sex and gender have been divorced from each other. No longer a curve, but now entrenched gender stereotypes at the edges and confusing everybody in the middle who doesn't conform to those particular stereotypes. It brought a lot of destruction, a lot of chaos, undone a century of women's advocacy by, by flattening out gender to only be the gender stereotypes, push them right to the edges and divorce it from sex. This is the culture in which we live, the growing culture in which we live. We don't buy into this alternate gospel. We don't buy into the competing worldview. We understand gender isn't culturally constructed. Gender stereotypes can be culturally constructed, which is why a century ago, pink was considered a boy's colour and blue was considered a girl's colour. Now it's inverted, it's the opposite. So stereotypes are enculturated, for sure. And because gender ideologies push their worldview, they've boosted everything gendered to the edges. So they say now, all well, boys, if they like pink, they must really be a girl. Or we've got to question it. Is this boy a girl because he likes pink? Whereas that's just 100 years ago, it would have been the other way. And the boy and the girl don't know these things because these are just those gender stereotypes. To say that sex and gender are divorced, I mean, from a biblical perspective, we'll look at this in a second, is to really say that you're divorced from reality. And it's based on a false assumption, false belief in the separation of body and mind and spirit. Which would then say, well, if your mind is at war with your body, then the, the growing cultural worldview is you are your mind and really your body is just a cover, malleable, insignificant. It's Gnosticism. It's an age-old counter-gospel. Christians have done a real disservice by leaning into this kind of platonic dualism, saying, well, you have a body and you have a mind and your, your mind really trumps your body and there's a divorcing of your mind from your body, which is how people can come to a place where they say, I am how I feel, I am not my biology. And Christians of the last century have really slid down that slippery slope as well. We've forgotten that we are embodied spirits. God made us whole. Embodied spirits. Not abstract mind, abstract spirit, abstract body that all seem to come together and, and live in harmony, but then sometimes they don't live in harmony. No, no, we are embodied spirits. This is why the hope of the resurrection is so important. That's why the first century Christians looked to the resurrection. They said, man, I can't wait. To die is to be apart from the body. To be, to be abstracted from the body. That's a heinous thing, actually. But the resurrection is the, 
renewed embodiment in a glorified body. Because we are only whole when we are body and our mind and our spirit. The Bible calls that unity a soul. You're not a disembodied spirit or a floating mind. You are your biology. We see this right from the very beginning. From Genesis 1 to Genesis 3, we see God bringing order out of chaos. So you look at the beginning of Genesis 1, the Spirit of God hovering over the waters. This Hebrew sign of disorder, of chaos. And what does God do over six days? Brings order out of the chaos. And then what does He do? He orders us. He brings us into order. This is what it says of of God's creation in Genesis 1. Uh, Then God said, Let us make man in our image according to our likeness. They'll rule the fish of the sea, the birds of the sky, the livestock, the whole earth, and the creatures that crawl on the earth. So God made man in his own image. He created him in the image of God. He created them male and female. So he orders his creation over five days. Sixth day, he orders brings us into his order and he says, I'm going to put them in charge over the creation to join me in the work of bringing creative order. He orders us, brings order out of chaos, brings us into his order, makes us ordered and then invites us to join him in his ordering of creation. Genesis 2. Then the Lord God formed the man out of the dust. It's another angle of the same story. The dust from the ground breathed the breath of life into his nostrils and the man became a living being. So the spirit of breath, the spirit, sorry, or the breath of life into the body. Again, saying we are embodied spirits. We are whole, unified, integrated. We're not a mind abstract of our body. You are your body. This isn't the platonic or the Gnostic view. This is the biblical view. This is the reality of the world. You are your body. That's why Paul, again, looking forward to the resurrection, said, I can't wait for the day when we're reunited with our bodies. Then we are whole forever. We who are supposed to join God in his creative work of bringing order out of disorder bringing beauty out of chaos. Instead, what's happening especially now in our culture, this competing worldview, instead is joining Satan in his effort to bring chaos, disorder out of God's created order. And it is satanic. I'm not saying that as a kind of, you know, super spiritual kind of pejorative kind of sense. What I'm saying is Satan is the one who comes and says, did God really say? Here's, here is the order God has created. And Satan comes and says, nah, mate. Not, not that. God's withholding from you, don't you know? Don't do it his way. Don't conform to his order. Don't join him in his ordering work in the world. Listen to me. And he sows disorder, sows chaos. And genuinely, when we do the same, we're joining him in his work. This is what I say when this is what I mean when I say it's satanic. I don't mean like people are, you know, drawing pentagrams on the ground and goat's blood and candles and and chants and things like this. I'm saying they are in the very ordinary sense of joining Satan in his work. This is not a default neutral worldview. It's a competing gospel. The work of Satan. Teen clinical depression has doubled in the last decade. Before that, depression was on the way down, actually, incidences of depression. Things seemed to be getting better. Suicide was going down. You look at the graph of suicide, down, 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 down. 2012, up, 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 up. Rise of smartphones, social media, People, we looked at this a couple of weeks ago, people had never before known ability to carefully curate their own communities, to listen to voices they wanted to and block out voices they didn't want to listen to. A generation growing up with no anchor, with no teachers, no fathers, 
unlimited choice. They can do whatever they want to do, wherever they want to do it. No idea, no idea who they are, where they belong, how to make meaning. And along comes a worldview that says, you don't know who you are. You're different. You're not like other people because you're in the wrong body. Did God really say? No. Listen to me. God made a mistake, but we can fix you. This is the gospel of the world. And it has particular power over boys and girls, men and women, especially those who are on the autism spectrum, if you have a look at uh, the statistics. People who are already at the edges of society, people who already have other mental health issues are particularly susceptible. People who already feel like, oh, I don't fit in. And here comes a group of people who say, uh, you don't fit in, but we can help you. You are not your body. That's the problem. We can help you. So the culture works first by abstracting us from our family, abstracting us from our community. And you see this in the particularly pernicious incidences of people at certain schools, less so in Australia, thankfully, but I've heard firsthand from parents that it's happening in Australia. So things like, well, your parents don't need to know, but we, we'll call you whatever you want to be called. We'll encourage you because you are your mind and not your body. Your body's a problem. We will treat you how you want to be treated according to your mind. They've abstracted us from family, from community, and then eventually abstract us from our bodies, mind from body. It's disastrous. And again, it's the chaotic work of Satan. You know, a generation ago, when young women looked up to an idealistic, like gender stereotyped version of an ideal woman, uh, the trend was the young women would starve themselves, called anorexia. The dysphoria at not looking like that idealized version turned into a dysmorphia where they'd look at their body and they'd see something other than what was the reality of their body. It was disastrous. Still has lingering effects today. They couldn't see what was plain to everybody else. Today, because <clears throat> that particular worldview has pushed the gender stereotypes to the edges, flattened out that curve and says, if you don't belong to this, young women are looking up and saying, I don't feel like this. Maybe that means I'm that. And it's just a whole lot of chaos and confusion in the middle when men feel out of sync with their bodies and claim to really be a woman, they run to elicit the idealised physical form of a woman, not the things that actually make women unique, like that internal power, the drive to protect young from being eaten and figuratively from being eaten today. Uh, bringing life into the world, being uniquely self-giving, those kinds of things, but rather the externalities, just the veneer the clothing, the hair, the makeup, the voice. So we need to make sure we are teaching boys and girls what it means to be a man and woman, and men and women. Because again, no default, neutral worldview, only competing worldviews. And where we don't proclaim the good news, the order of God, people will only hear this loud and growing louder voice telling them, you are not your body. It's a lie. It's false. It's destructive nonsense. And we let our young people, we kind of give them over to the world when we don't understand there are only competing worldviews. We must train up our young men and women. When your body and your mind aren't in sync, the world says, conform your mind to the world, conform your body to your mind. So your body is malleable. Body is editable. Your body doesn't really matter. What matters is what you think, and then we will make your environment suit your disordered mind. And I use that word in, a, in its technical sense. It is disordered, out of order, not just out of order with God's created order, but until recently we recognized it as being out of order. The Spirit says, rather, conform your mind to Jesus, and you are your body. 
you are already integrated. And so the conforming this happened is conforming your mind to Jesus. This is what Paul writes to the Romans. It says, oh, the depths and the riches and the wisdom and the knowledge of God, how unsearchable his judgments, how untraceable his ways. We can't trace over his ways because they are so wonderful, so amazing, so perfect, the way that he has brought order. For who has known the mind of the Lord or who has been his counsellor? Who said to God, you know what would be a good idea, God? Giving him any ideas he didn't already have or know? Nobody, rhetorical question. And who has ever given to God that he should be repaid? For from him and through him and to him are all things. To him be the glory forever, amen. Therefore, brothers and sisters, in view of the mercies of God, I urge you to present your bodies as a living sacrifice holy and pleasing to God. This is your true worship. Do not be conformed to this age, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind so that you may discern what is the good, pleasing and perfect will of God. What do we learn from Paul here? Your bodies are for worship. Our bodies are for worship. They're not junk evolutionary mistakes. Are they subject to a fallen world? Absolutely. Do they fail us and break down? Absolutely. Your bodies are for worship. Not just bags of flesh for customization or disregard. God cares about your body because you are your body. You're not just your body, but you are your body. You are your body. We need to reintegrate our understanding of our body and our mind. And a spirit. Secondly, don't be conformed to the age. We need to remind ourselves of this always. Again, reminding ourselves this is not a default worldview that is just the normal standard and we believe something weird over here. There are only competing worldviews. Don't worship false gods. Don't accept pagan practices like Paul writes to Ephesus, says, have nothing to do with the fruitless deeds of darkness, but rather expose them. Don't join them. Don't go, well, it doesn't really matter. It doesn't really matter that I'm joining in the work of Satan to bring disorder, where God has called, created, and commanded us to be about, be about his work of creating order. This is one of the reasons that I personally don't use preferred pronouns. I won't join a lie. I will call somebody whatever they want to be called in terms of names. I understand people, uh, one of my best mates actually, uh, a long time ago now, uh, changed his name. I'm like, I'm going to call you that name. But I can't join a lie. I have nothing to do with the fruitless deeds of darkness, but rather expose them. I can't call a man her or she because joining Satan in his deconstructive undoing of created order. Can't do it. Thirdly, be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Not to be transformed by the mutilation of your body. Hear the Spirit's solution. It's not my mind and my body are abstract and out of sync, therefore I'll edit my body but my mind and my body are integrated. I am an integrated whole, an embodied mind and spirit. And therefore, if something is wrong with my mind, I need to conform my mind to Jesus, renew my mind. Renewing the mind used to be the goal of medicine and psychology for a long time, and all of a sudden has abandoned this goal in favor of a destructive and again, satanic worldview. Because you're an embodied spirit, bring your mind and your body into sync. If the mind and body are out of sync, it's not the body that needs to change. We used to know this instinctively. The sermon would have been ridiculous to preach 25 years ago. 61 to 88% of people will age out of gender dysphoria. Almost 90%. If left alone, if not given gender affirming care, which is euphemistic, euphemistic for joining Satan in his 
undoing of God's created order. Almost all of them will grow out of it. So what do we do? We need to stop affirming. And the vast majority will naturally resync their body, not even with help, let alone with help. Uh, there are some um, countries in the West that are starting to kind of, who have run headfirst down this, listening to this growing dominant worldview, have started to pivot away. Uh, thinking of places like in the UK, the Tavistock Centre, that is essentially closed down, where they used to do this, again, gender-affirming care, which is mutilating bodies to bring them in line with a disordered mind under the guise of care. Treated with drugs and surgery. People who were treated with drugs and surgery a decade ago now come back and suing people, individuals and the system, saying, you wrecked my life. Uh, one doctor in this, John, uh, Johns Hopkins doctor, Paul McHugh, said, treat the false pro problematic nature of the assumption, not the body. So we don't want to treat the body for a problem in the mind. We've got to treat the problem in the mind. Dr. Dave Bell, he is a distinguished psychiatrist, psychoanalyst. He was also staff governor at the Tavistock, where he worked in adult services for 25 years. He now puts medically transitioning children alongside the early 20th century craze for curing mental illness with lobotomies. And this is what he says. Like lobotomy, there's no evidence. Like lobotomy, it starts with a patient in an impossible state and initially seems to work, but then it becomes the universal cure. Bell argues that with mental, as opposed to physical medicine, the existence of a treatment create the, creates the illness. Good centers for pneumonia wouldn't create more pneumonia cases, whereas with false memory syndrome in the 90s, suddenly he had lots of cases. It was the same when Freud wrote about hysteria. And this is how he finishes his thought. He says, so I think we have a group who at one time would have been anorexic. A lot of them would have been self-harmers and had borderline personalities. But now they've become transgender. So they're people dealing with similar kinds of problems, but they get refracted through the lens of what's going on in the culture. And when asked, would you recommend gender-affirming care to a young person uncertain about their gender? He said, definitely not. The guy who pretty much ran the place for a generation. So we've got to abandon this foolishness. That's from a non-Christian perspective. Just reiterating the order, the goodness, the beauty in God's creation. This really exposes the lie of, would you rather a living daughter or a dead son? I don't know, people in this church have been told this. It's a, it's a lie, it's a grievous lie, but hear me say uh, that rates of suicide among gender dysphoric people, especially young people, is horrifically high. It's too high. So I'm not saying it's a lie that, they, that some of those people will end their lives because they will. And it's a tragedy. It's horrific. We must be a community where we offer the genuinely true and better good news because the present culture is proclaiming a worldview that itself is pushing these young people, confused sons and daughters, to the cliff by telling them they don't belong in order to support the false gospel, they're pushing people to the cliff, then yelling back at you, saying it's your fault if they jump off. No, no. It's the destructive worldview, abstracting kids from family and community, abstracting them from their bodies, which is leading to this death and chaos. It's not your love and care for them to try to help them come to terms with the truth. Now, we, we should do a lot of work about the, the nature of that help and that care. But don't buy that lie that says you have to join Satan's work of undoing God's created order in order to keep people alive. You know, they've done more longitudinal studies now. After 10 years, in one particularly gender 
transitioning, affirming culture they found among women, a 40 times increase in suicide for those post-surgery after 10 years. All of the studies coming out saying gender-affirming care is wonderful take into account just the euphoria that comes out immediately afterwards. All of the longer studies are pointing to death and destruction because that's Satan's mandate. That's what he does. Ultimately then we learn from this passage we want to renew our mind by gaining the mind of Christ. Then we can discern what is good, what is pleasing to God. When really, this is, a, this is just another uh, invitation from God to be about his business in the world. We can't shy back from our consistent and clear and gentle, compassionate, reverent voice into the culture and let them only hear one devastating worldview or gospel. We have to be in the culture, have to say, no, we're not going to join you. We're not going to join in the fruitless deeds of darkness, but rather we're going to expose them. At a personal level, man, I know, again, people firsthand who have been very good friends. Again, people who have been in my home dozens and dozens of times. People I've met with and prayed with and wept with and conversed with for hours and hours and hours who have heard another gospel and gone, I prefer that gospel over the gospel of Jesus. It's devastating. It's heartbreaking. Someone makes a record of their lives. The good news is that the good news is always there. Even when people... Even if you have gone, well, yeah, I have been actually joining in unknowingly, thinking it's the default worldview, not realizing it's a competing worldview. I've joined in. I've adopted these practices. And, and now what am I supposed to do? Man, this is, this is the good news. Only the gospel of grace gives you the ability to go total 180 on your view and say, actually, I can advocate for the truth now, even though I didn't before. Gospel frees us. Totally frees us from every stain, from all sin. Echoing that old hymn, you know, once was lost, but now I'm found. Once was blind, but now I see. The gospel is the, is the greatest, greatest hope. We don't have to say, well, I've gone down this, gone down this route a long way, or even if, you know, I've gone down that route personally, it's too late for me, I can't go back. Uh, no, that's not true. That's a lie itself as well. We looked at this a couple of weeks ago where our culture says you can't repent. Culture says if you step out of line, you're gone, you're cancelled, there's no coming back unless you conform. That's not so with Jesus. He says, come to me, come to me. Heavy laden, burden, come to me, I'll give you rest. Abandon trying to attain your own righteousness. Come and receive the righteousness of Jesus. Don't say I'm better off in the dark rather than exposing flaws or sin or folly, but rather come into the light because all of those things are paid for already. If you've already started down the transgender path, and I know there are people in our community who are really wrestling with their body and their mind not being aligned, and questioning their integration. What does that look like? I want to say, on behalf of all of us, we love you. You're welcome here. We love having you here. This is your home. We're your family. Don't buy the lie of the world that says, abstract yourself from family and go find people who are only going to say yes to whatever it is you already want to do. That's what God has, God has given us, family. We need each other. We love you. We want the best for you. We don't judge you. We're here for you. If you're scars from surgery and our regret, 
the best news in the world that it's true for all of us that our scars don't define us. Jesus' scars define us. We're not beholden to our previous path, not beholden to our previous worldview, not beholden to our previous actions. We come to Jesus and he doesn't just wipe our slate clean. He gives us his righteousness. He imputes to us his perfection. It's the most wonderful news. He made you, he loves you, he saved you. He's inviting you into a relationship with him even now. He's borne our sin, our foolishness, our rebellion, our shame. Return, in return, he gives us his love, his righteousness, his family, his inheritance, his spirit. And it's called to us all today is to be transformed by the renewing of your mind. That we come more and more into conformity to the likeness of Jesus. That we think more like him, love more like him, relate to the Father and to others more like him, to forgive more like him, to love more like him. We have to be a community. If we're going to be that countercultural community of love, within the wider community, like the city set on a hill, like the light on a lampstand, shining light to all in the house. We have to be a community of love. We can't just shout into, into the culture <clears throat> um, in an unreverent kind of way like we looked at before. Neither can we wear on the other side and never speak into culture so we don't ever offend anybody or make someone feel bad. We have to speak the truth in love. Let's pray together. Father, I want to thank you for your kindness and your goodness to us in Jesus. Lord, I want to ask in particular on behalf of, uh, firstly, everybody who is struggling with, I mean, any mental illness or any dysphoria or in any way doesn't feel comfortable or integrated in their body or in their community or in their context. Father, by your spirit, would you please do a work. Help us to be a community of love where people can struggle, people can wrestle, where they are loved with the love of Jesus, where we put your love on display to them and also where we speak your truth are about your order. Lord, help us to be firm and stand firm in a culture that presents and proclaims a wildly counter good news, even one aligned with Satan. Help us, Father, to not be enticed or seduced by it, but to fix our eyes on Jesus, be about your business in the world, and to love people as you've loved us. We pray this in Jesus' name for his sake. Amen.